A lot of the stuff we look at as technical is just physical with a racket. Okay, and if we can start understanding that, then we can start looking at the physical portions of what we do um, in a way that's much more productive in terms of actually building a tennis player and building good solid technique as well. Uh, I'll give you a couple of really simple ones straight off, right, that we learned a few years ago. Just uh, posture is really massively important. Right. If you don't have good posture, it affects everything you do. I just want to show you. So, so for a second, just to start the morning, pretend that you are a 13-year-old emo boy. Right? And stand like that. Right. So round your shoulders off, put your arms down straight by your side like that. Okay. And every, you know, anyone ask you a question, you go, yeah, whatever. Right, so you stand like this. Okay, you have to be rounded with your shoulders. Now try and lift one of your knees as high as you possibly can. Okay? Right, now stand up straight like Patrick Swayze in Dirty Dancing. This is my space, this is your space. Right, shoulders back nice and tall like this. Lift your knee as high as you possibly can. You see how effective good posture could help you run better? Yeah, if you're like this, actually moving, lifting your knees is harder. If you're here, lifting your knees is better. Right, okay, let's do something tennis fighting. Go back to your emo position. Okay. Rotate as far to the side as you can as if you're in a forehand. Okay, see how you can't go so far? Now stand up. Now rotate. See the difference? Yeah, so those are some of the things we're gonna tackle in physical, because so we're gonna spend quite a lot of time on it. And one of the reasons we're gonna spend quite a lot of time on it is you have a certain window to establish physical skills with kids. At 10 years old, your brain uh, does something called synaptic pruning. Sounds very technical, I'll explain it for us tennis coaches. Imagine every movement pattern that you ever do is like a plant and you stick it in your garden. So your brain's like a garden and say for example um, running was the running plant you stick it in the garden. Yeah. Uh, playing Xbox and Nintendo with your thumbs is still a movement, right? That's the Xbox plant. Put that in the garden. By the time you're 10, your garden's so full of plants. It doesn't have any room to do any to do anymore, to establish anymore. So what it does is it cuts down the ones that you haven't used very much to make room for the ones that you do use the most. Now your brain does this unconsciously. You have no control over it. All right. So if you haven't been running, jumping, throwing, catching, been athletic up to the age of ten, if you've just been sat on the sofa playing Xbox, your brain goes. You know what, we don't use that running one very much. Let's put it in the trash, get rid of it so we can get more room for the thumb one, which we really use a lot. Your brain specializes. Okay, so if we don't do those things by the time these kids are 10 and do them well, yeah, you are never gonna be able to catch them up because there are gonna be other plants in the way. Yeah, And at the point you're, you're 10, it's easy to remove certain plants and replace them with others. Later on, they'll full grow trees. And you've had this. You've had this when you've had adults come to your tennis lessons who are, let's call them, non-athletic adults. I often call them golf adults. Because the only question really when they come to the lesson is, should I suggest golf now or wait till the end of the lesson before I suggest golf? Because they clearly can't run or move or judge the ball. There is very little you can do because the problem happened before they were 10. Of course, you can make everybody a little bit better. Of course, you can make everybody a little bit more athletic, whatever age, but the problems have already happened. So in this space that we're talking about now, if you don't do that thing very well, you're always playing catch up. And a lot of the times what we see is that manifests itself, um, it manifests itself later on when you come out of the other end of puberty, when tennis becomes very physical. So you get this kid who looks really good at 10, he looks okay at 11, 12, he's winning tournaments, he's a big kid, he's not a great athlete but he's a great striker of the ball, but now he comes out of puberty at 15, 16 and now tennis is very, very, very physical. But the wrong plants are in the garden and they can't establish and continue to grow anymore and now this is when he suffers. And that happens over and over and over again because the kids who hit well uh, uh, Sometimes you just do 
loads of hitting, don't do a lot of good physical work, and just hit more balls, are still winning at those 10s and 12s. So it's a bit of a hard story for us to really work on because it's kind of like the story of the three little pigs. You can build the straw house and it looks okay and it will stand for a while. And everyone's laughing at the brick house over here because the kids are maybe not hitting so many balls and doing more physical work. But actually, it ends up being a much better product, but you've got to be able to keep the faith, if you like, as you move through and you've got to explain to parents what we're doing and all those kind of things. So it's going to be a really important section for us to work on. Uh, then after that we're going to look at competitive skills and the reason we're going to look at competitive skills are what we started off with yesterday morning which is um, our job is to get kids to play the game of tennis. You should judge your program based on how many kids play in competition. That doesn't mean sac sanctioned tournaments. It could be junior team tennis, that could be turning up with their friends at the club and playing matches. That's equally fine. right? but how many kids actually go out and play a game of tennis on a regular basis? That's your job, right? to get them to do that. Giving lessons is equipping them with the skills so they can do those things. But, um, I always tell the story, there was, a, there was a, a documentary, I don't really remember it years ago, about a little boy who moved, I think from Florida, called Jan Silva. And he moved to I, Paris. Yeah. yeah. He moved to Paris when he was five, with his whole family to train at the Patrick Motorogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalogalog
Is there anything else you would like to get out of today and we can see if we can squeeze it in? All right? Okay, just talk with two other, two other people. 